following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In ancient times, all of the knowledge that was taught to humanity was presented in an integral way, in an integrated form. It's only in modern times, very recent times, that humanity has the, developed the tendency or the desire to compartmentalize knowledge or to separate out different forms of wisdom or knowledge. So in our ancient past, all of our art and science, philosophy, religion, were all taught as one. No element was separated or taught as a separate school. So the, amongst the Egyptians, the Persians, the Chinese, the Aztec, all of the ancient civilizations, the great philosophers and kings and wise men and women always taught and spoke and wrote and delivered their teachings in a very integrated way. In modern times, we've lost that tradition. One of the forms in which <clears throat> the synthesis of wisdom and knowledge was taught was through a symbol called the cross. And the cross is ubiquitous to humanity. It appears in every culture. And the cross, of course, has four hands or four limbs that stretch out from a central point. The central point in the context of this lecture is the synthesis, is the combination, the unification of all the elements of wisdom and knowledge. So if we were to examine the breadth and scope of all of human knowledge and wisdom, we would say it's synthesized in the heart of this cross. But its four major parts would be religion, philosophy, science, and art. So as you've been listening to the lectures and studying the books of Gnosis, you've undoubtedly recognized that Gnosis teaches religion, that Gnosis teaches philosophy, and Gnosis teaches science. But what about art? This concept or aspect of the teaching related to art somehow manages to elude most students and instructors. But when we look at these four pillars, these four primary aspects of the ancient wisdom of humanity, we can see that art is the means to express the other three. 
Art is the way to communicate, the way to see, the way to experience, the way to touch, to taste, to ingest, to, to deliver, to reflect the religion, the philosophy, and the science. So art is the method. The other three, the religion, the philosophy, and the science, <clears throat> are the wisdom itself, and the art is the method. So, of course, these are the two primary aspects of Buddhism, method and wisdom. And it's the union of method and wisdom that produces the awakening of the consciousness, the birth of the Buddha inside. So as students, when we come to study this tradition or something related to it, we study the religion, the philosophy, and the science through books, through lectures. But we study the art through practice. Because that art is internal. It's the art of the consciousness. It's the art of awakening. What this means, and you can probably understand quite easily, is that art is the act of creation. And we, of course, know that art is creative. The nature of creativity is to give birth to something new, to create to bring life, to bring something of great beauty into the world. But that creation, that art, is supported by the religion, the philosophy, and the science. Without those three other pillars, art remains empty, devoid of form or meaning or effectiveness. So, as students of gnosis, students of knowledge, it's necessary for us to have a good, firm, solid understanding of the religion, the philosophy, and the science. And only in that way can we activate the art, can we actually create. But create inside, create as a consciousness, as a soul, as a mind, as a heart. Each of these forms, or pillars, contains the other. They really can't be separated. We separate them for matters of explanation in order to explore and understand the way the teaching works. But in reality, they are all one. And this is why we study the symbol of the cross. This is one symbol. It symbolizes one thing. But it has a significance in its structure, which is very deep. Creation is a sacred act. To create something, to give birth, is always something very sacred and holy. The very force that gives us the capacity to create is our very life, is the very existence that we have. And that life is sacred. The energy that gives us the capacity to create is sacred. It is the direct connection that we have to God. This energy that descends down the tree of life as the ray of creation is the force, the life force, which makes creation possible in all the levels of nature, in all the dimensions. And we have that creative potential, that creative power within us, in our psyche, in our mind, in our heart, but most especially in our sexuality. In our sexuality, we have the power to create life, to bring life into the world. And this is a very sacred power. But that same potential to create a new physical body, to give birth to a child, is the same energy that gives us the capacity to create with the mind and the heart. Is the same energy that fuels our psyche. In the Gnostic tradition, whether in Egypt or Greece or in Mexico, wherever you find the ancient Gnostic tradition, you always find that the highest ideal is beauty. 
Beauty in the tree of life in Hebrew is tiferet. And beauty is related with the human soul. This sphere on the tree of life, Tiferet, corresponds directly to our human soul, to our human consciousness, that which makes us what we are, gives us the capacity to be alive. And it is the essence, the very nature of our soul. It's with beauty that the soul is developed. by the influence, by the effect, by the development and cultivation of beauty. So this is the great art, the great work. The greatest art is the cultivation of the beauty of the human soul, of Tiferet. When we look at creation as a whole, we see that the highest form of cognizant life in our particular level is the humanoid, each one of us. We are the potential from which the highest beauty can emerge. And we know from our traditions and throughout our histories that we have certain human beings who've arisen, who have manifested that great beauty and have inspired millions because they fully realized the potential of their own consciousness. We can look to millions of examples of great human beings who, without concern for anything other than the highest ideal, developed that ideal in themselves. Beauty in itself is the influence or force that is essential for the unfoldment of the human consciousness. This is something that Plotinus described in detail in his philosophy the importance of beauty for the development of the soul. And it was recognized by all the ancient philosophers that communities or civilizations within which beauty is highly respected and cultivated in turn developed highly developed individuals. Cultures that have held beauty as their ideal and worked towards beauty in all their works of architecture, music, painting, philosophy, and religion, and in their sciences. These are the same civilizations that produced the greatest people in history. And on the contrary, those civilizations that celebrated discord, chaos, lust, pride, anger, or avarice produced the worst of humanity. So we can see from that that the influence of beauty on the force of creation is deeply profound. And this is why in this tradition we always emphasize and recommend that students should should listen to beautiful music, should surround themselves with beautiful art, should cultivate the fine arts, and develop an understanding of the principles of beauty, of art. All physical forms reflect their origin. So our physical body reflects its own origin. Our physical body contains the marks, the influences of our parents. This is inescapable. Our physical form contains the marks and influences of the environment that we came from. And so in that simple way, you can see that the forces that surround us, the forces that give rise to creation, make a lasting impact. So going forward, we should reflect on this. Realize the things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we cultivate, produce something. We create. We create through our thoughts, through our feelings, and through our actions. But are we creating according to a high ideal of beauty? Or are we creating in accordance with the the longings of the ego? With the longings of our greed or pride? We ourselves are a form of art. 
But who is creating that? Who is the artist? Who in us are we giving the energy, the power, to create our mind, to create our soul? And this is the fundamental question. That process of creation is unfolding from moment to moment. Our birth into the physical world is just the beginning of a certain chapter in our development. But the process of creation is ongoing. The energies in us that give capacity to create are flowing in us constantly from moment to moment. And we, by our will, utilize that energy. So who is making us? As a human being, we are the ultimate art, highest art. And our goal, the purpose of life, is to become a perfect human being, to become a perfect form of art, a perfect reflection of our creator. When you look at any great work of art, what you see there is a reflection of the consciousness of the one who made it. So when you observe a Greek sculpture, or you listen to one of the great symphonies, or you see one of the ancient beautiful paintings of past times, or, for example, the pyramids of Egypt. What you see in those dazzling, beautiful creations is the consciousness of the one who created it. And in this way, we can see very clearly the difference between our modern culture and the ones of the ancient past. That in those ancient civilizations, beauty as the ideal Virtue, as the ideal, become embodied in the many forms of art. We see how much is celebrated in ancient art and how much longevity there is in those forms of creation, whether it's architecture, sculpture, writing, poems, plays. But in these times, we don't celebrate these ideals. We celebrate lust. We celebrate greed. We celebrate hate. This is a distinct difference. In terms of the human being, throughout art, throughout the history of art, the human being was always the central topic. Not only because we have the potential to become real human beings, but because all the ancient artists knew that the human being contains the potential to become the highest ideal of creation to become a great Buddha, a Paramatasatya, a Dharmakaya, to become that perfected mind, the embodiment of love, the embodiment of all the highest ideals. And so this is why art has always, in past times, reflected that perfection. In the Bible, we have an interesting story about this process of the creation of the perfect human being. It's a story in the book of Kings. <clears throat> and the details that are written in this story in the Bible are somewhat scanty, somewhat uh, unclarified. But that story of King David and his son King Solomon and the building of the Temple of Solomon was taken and elaborated upon by the Freemasons who have as their core mythology the story of Hiram Abif. Hiram Abif is the great architect. The story goes that when David, the king of Israel, passed his kingdom to his son, Solomon, Solomon needed to develop. He needed a house. So he built his house. And this is symbolic of building the first stage of the soul. Solomon is a term or a phrase that hides solar man, which is a real human being 
the person who has created the solar bodies or the vehicles of the soul. And these solar bodies are here in the tree of life. And these are the solar mental body, solar astral body, and solar causal body, or body of will. So Solomon is an initiate. He is someone who has been initiated into the mysteries and has developed a certain degree of soul. But Solomon himself is actually our monad, our own inner Buddha, our own inner spirit, chesed. Chesed sits here on the tree of life. This is our spirit. In Hinduism, he's called Atman. In the sacred tarot, he is the magician, the first arcanum. The magician is the magi, the priest, the lama, the one who has all the wisdom, all the knowledge, the one who has the power to create. And of course, if you know anything about Jewish or Christian history, you know that Solomon was a great magician, a great priest, and had great powers and great wisdom. But in the process of building his house, it says in the Bible that Solomon loved the Lord and walked in the statutes of David his father. And what this means is that Solomon, being our own inner Buddha, obeys the laws of creation. He follows in the, the laws of the Lord, the Elohim, the great divine laws of karma and other laws that manage creation. Yet, he, Solomon, in the story is not developed. He has reached Tiferet, beauty, which is the development of the human soul. And when this process is accomplished, this means that the human soul, the human consciousness, does the will of the inner spirit, follows the will of God. Meaning, that soul, that person has learned how to do what is right. To know the difference between the ego and the consciousness. To know the difference between following the impulses of desire and following the impulses of the consciousness, the spirit, that which knows. At this point in the story, it says in the Bible that the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king in place of David, even though I am but a little child. I do not know how to come out or go in. Solomon, or our own innermost, our own inner Buddha, is recognizing that he is but a child, a beginner. Even having developed the soul and having developed all that magical power and wisdom, he is a child. What he asks for is wisdom. He doesn't ask for riches, for fame, for glory. He asks for wisdom. And the meaning there is very significant. Wisdom, in Hebrew, is chokmah. Chokmah appears at the second sephira, sephira on the tree of life. Chokmah means wisdom, the same as bodhi in Sanskrit. When he asks for that, this is symbolic of the innermost, chesed, asking to become a bodhisattva, to incarnate bodhi or wisdom, to move beyond the stage of tiferet and to enter into the path of the bodhisattva, the straight path, the direct path, to become that to become a mirror or incarnation of light. So, the Lord agrees. He sends Hiram Abif to assist Solomon in the building of the temple. So you see, Solomon built his house first, which is the soul, but now he has to build the temple, which is the full development of the soul. So the temple of Solomon is symbolic. It symbolizes the development 
full development of our consciousness. Hirama Beef, in the tradition, is a great master of all the arts and crafts, like Hermes or Padmasambhava, who's a master of all the sciences, a master of astrology, of construction, of art, of embroidery, of sculpture, of music. All of the ancient sciences were unified as one work, and Hirama Beef was a master of that. Hirama Beef comes as the architect of the temple. So in this sense, in this case, we see Hirama Beef symbolizes the Christ. The Christ who's born in the manger of the soul of Solomon, who comes to build the temple of the Lord. This is in the same way that Padmasambhava arrived into Tibet in order to build the great monasteries, the great temples of Tibetan Buddhism. It's the same. That part of the story is symbolic. At this point, we hear in the Bible and in the, the, Mason, the Masonic tradition that the temple is built out of cedar and pine, two precious forms of wood, and adorned with gold and silver and all manner of jewels. And all of this is symbolic. Manly Hall, who wrote the great book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, states that according to the ancient Rabin, Solomon was an initiate of the mystery schools, and the temple he built was actually a house of initiation containing pagan, philosophic, and phallic emblems. Pomegranates, palm-headed columns, pillars at the door, Babylonian cherubim, and the arrangement of chambers and draperies all indicate the temple to have been patterned after the sanctuaries of Egypt and Atlantis. So this is all symbolic of the temple of the soul, the temple of the consciousness. The pine and cedar logs Hiram had brought across the waters. They were delivered across the waters and delivered to the mount of the temple, which is a great hill. But all of the parts of the temple the stones, the wood, the gold, everything was crafted away from the location of the temple itself because the temple had to be constructed in silence. All the parts were built elsewhere and then brought to the temple mount and assembled in absolute silence. This is symbolic, naturally. In the center of the temple was the cubic stone, the perfect cube, which has nine faces, and that nine-faced cube relates to the ninth sphere, Yasod. And if we place this tree of life over the body of a human being, we see that Yasod sits directly over the sexual organs. So the holiest of holies, the most holy part of the Temple of Solomon, relates to sex. We can see that this temple, the story of the temple in the Bible and the story of the temple in masonry is symbolic when we look in the New Testament where Paul says, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So in this story we see that the mount symbolizes our head. This is the mount upon which that temple is constructed. The wood, the cedar, and the pine symbolize other important aspects of our physiology, which we'll come to. The temple itself in the, in the tradition stood in its place for 33 years. This is the same amount of time that David ruled as king. This is the same number of segments that we have in our spine. It's the same number of degrees in masonry. And it's the same number of years that Jesus lived. So the number 33 is symbolic. 
and points to our spinal column, which is the central column of the temple. The spinal column is where the temple is built. Upon the top of the spine sits our head, which is the mount. And that head on the tree of life is the logos, the Lord, the dharmakaya, the trikaya. Hirama Beef is that great architect who organizes the construction of the temple. And when we look at the word Hiram in Hebrew, we get some clues as to the meaning of these symbols. The first letter in his name is Hep, which relates to life, Hama, Chaim. This is the life force of the sun, <clears throat> the solar light, the fire of the Kundalini. It's that fire which must be raised up the spinal column in order to illuminate the temple and give it life. The second letter is Yod, which symbolizes the masculine sexual potency. The third letter is Resh, which symbolizes the head, the mount, which that fire must reach in the development of the temple. And the last letter is Mem, which is the waters from which the wood is delivered to the temple. The sexual waters, the waters of creation. So the name Hiram contains all this hidden symbolism and indicates and points to the Christ. So this whole story is an allegory of how we need to raise the sacred fire of Het up our spinal column into the head. That process is a process of initiation. That fire, that light, is extracted from the water, from Mem. And that's done by means of the great art of the initiate, through creation. That fire of Christ is pulled out of the waters by means of Tantra, by means of transmutation. When we place our human consciousness, our human willpower, as the dominator, the controller of our energy. And then we harness the sexual force, all of the energy is within, and deliver that energy up the spine in order to awaken the kundalini of all of the seven bodies, the seven serpents. And that way, the energy rises and saturates the head, which is where the pineal gland is. And the pineal gland, when it's awakened and opened, is the eye of Shiva, the eye of the prophet, the third eye, the source of clairvoyance. This is how we take from the soma or the ambrosia, the amrita, the sacred nectar of the gods, the sexual energy, the fire of creation. And we create the soul. We create the temple. This is done when we know the science, the philosophy, and the religion. And in this way, we can perform the art of transmutation, the art of transforming that which is base and low and inferior into that which is divine. We see that the types of wood have significance here. The two types of wood mentioned repeatedly in the story are cedar and pine. And this is because the energy, the consciousness that's behind those plants has direct relationships to the process of initiation. Cedar is used in temple construction because of its sacred nature. Cedar is the wood used on all the doors of the temples. And this is because the angel of the cedar is related to the door, the chakra, muladhara, which is at the base of the spine. And it's through that doorway that the fire must enter into the channel of the spine through that door of the cedar tree, the symbol of the chakra muladhara. That's why all the temples have doors of cedar. We enter into the temple of God through the proper use of sexual energy. 
through the doors of the cedar in ourselves. When that fire raises up the spinal column, when we surpass all the difficulties of the construction and that fire enters into the head, to the mount, it inflames and invigorates the pineal gland. The word pineal comes from pine, the pine gland. And the pine tree is, has an esoteric relationship with the mind. And this is part of the reason why monasteries and places of meditation are often built in environments with cedar and pine trees because these trees have an influence on our own development, the intelligence of these trees, the powers of these trees. When the pineal gland is saturated with light, with this fire of Hiram, of Christ, that eye opens. The pineal gland is inflamed. Clairvoyance is born. This is why in all of the world's traditions, we see the saints have a halo of light around their heads, all over the world. And that halo is the transmuted sexual energy, which is illuminating the pineal gland and filling them with light, giving them the capacity to see with this third eye, the pineal gland. It's that capacity that is the great source of all of the world's most spectacular art. Through the window of the third eye, the great prophets have made their prophecies. The great artists have composed their paintings. The great musicians have composed their symphonies. The pine tree is also where we get the tradition of the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is a symbol of the tree of life, the Kabbalah. And we always see in Western tradition how the Christmas tree is decorated with lights and usually it has a star on top or an angel. And this is symbolic of how that fire rises up the tree and illuminates all its parts with the little lights or candles that were placed on the tree till reaching its ultimate expression at the very peak, which is our own inner star, our own inner angel. The pine, if you look into ancient Egyptian scriptures, you'll see that the deceased are entering into the hallmark, the hall of judgment with a pine cone on their head. And this is because the deceased in the book of the dead of the Egyptians is deceased psychologically, has killed the ego, and has developed the pine cone which is the pineal gland. And actually, the shape of the pineal gland is roughly similar to a pine cone. We see also in Greek mysteries that the conductors of the rituals would have a staff, which is the spine, and on top of that staff would be a pine cone, which is the pineal gland. So when Hiram came and organized all the workers to build the temple, he organized them in three groups according to their capacities. He organized them with the first group, which are the apprentices, the second group, which are the craftsmen, and the third group and highest, which are the masters. And in this way, he organized all the workers of the temple so that everyone could fulfill their duties to the best of their ability and no one would fall short. But unfortunately, there were three craftsmen who felt they deserved the title of master. And so they plotted to force Hiram, the architect, to reveal to them the passwords, the secret knowledge of the master. So they confronted, ambushed, and killed Hiram Abif in the temple. These three, naturally, you can see, symbolize the three traitors of, of ourselves, the three traitors in us, the demon of the mind, the demon of desire, and the demon of evil will, the three daughters of Mara, these three traitors in our own psyche who plot to kill the soul, to kill the Christ, to undo the work of the temple. Why? Because of pride. 
because of envy. Envy is the secret trigger of evil action. Envy is that psychological quality which desires to have what someone else has. <clears throat> when we see someone who's successful and we want that, that is envy. And that is ego. Envy causes harm. Envy is the great destroyer of art. Envy destroyed the temple. Envy destroyed Rome. Destroyed the Aztecs. Destroyed all the great civilizations. Envy and fear and pride and lust. All of these qualities which make up that horrible creature called the ego. Fear is closely related to envy. We envy what someone else has because of fear in many cases. When we feel that we have, that we don't have something that we need, usually it's because we're afraid of something else. For example, we see a rich person, we envy their wealth because we're afraid of poverty or we're afraid of illness or we're afraid of any number of different circumstances that we imagine. So fear and envy in this way, you can see, work closely together. It's important for us to be very aware of how these three traitors interfere with the construction of our own temple because they always try to interfere. The way we overcome them is by applying the method that Hiram Abif was using, which is to build the temple in silence, in meditation. When we work in meditation, when we maintain silence in the temple grounds, then we have the capacity to always be aware and watching when the three traders approach. We will hear them. We will see them. We will sense them. But if we don't meditate, if we don't keep our mind in a state of serenity, in a state of watchfulness, then it's very easy for the three traders to overcome us. It's very easy for our envy, our pride, our lust, our fear, and any of those other elements in our own mind to take over in order to feed themselves. The creation of the soul, the creation of the temple, takes a lot of courage. We have to become fearless to do our will, to do the will of God, the will of our inner Buddha. Not the will of envy, not the will of pride, not the will of fear, but to do what is right. To do what is right even though it's scary, even though it looks impossible, even though it looks like we're crazy. We have to always reflect on this. We don't know our own capacities because we don't know our being. We don't know what we can do because we don't even know ourselves. We listen to fear, which always tells us, you need to go get a good job and make money. You need to find a good husband or a good wife to have security. You need to be respected. You need this, you need that. All of these are excuses, desires, lies. Fear is the great enemy. Envy is the great enemy. Pride is the great enemy. If Samael M. Vior had listened to his fear, we would not have these teachings. If Gandhi had listened to his fear, India would still be in ruins. If, if Jesus had listened to his fear, or Buddha, any of these great human beings, Joan of Arc, George Washington, they wouldn't have been able to accomplish their works. So it's important for us in our own lives to build the temple of our soul by doing what's right. In this way, we need to understand that art, like the other aspects of the teaching, is a polarity. Like the consciousness itself, 
like most things in nature, art has a duality. There is high art and there is low art. There are many degrees between. The highest forms of art are forms of creation which bring high ideals into form, into matter, which create and elaborate something higher and bring that into existence. So this we can see if we look at the philosophy of Buddha, if we look at the architecture of the Egyptians, if we look at the beauties hidden in the language of the Chinese, we can see that there are hints and elements, there are aspects of these forms of art that are very high, that are very beautiful. If we look at the symphonies of Beethoven, we can see and taste and experience forms of harmony and structure and laws that are beyond the capacity of our intellect to understand. But there's clearly a structure. There's clearly a principle. There's clearly laws, but very high. That is what we would call genuine art, real art. But we also have degenerated art, or low art. And these are forms of creation that bring what is inferior into manifestation. And this is very common now. These forms of art celebrate and feed and develop the ego. These are forms of art that celebrate discord, chaos, lack of harmony, lack of beauty, lack of virtue, the celebration of greed, the celebration of avarice, of lust, of gluttony. So when we look at what we in these times call art, this is generally what we find. People say now that Movies are the great art of these times. But what is celebrated in the movies that are made these days? Lust, violence. Who are the great heroes of our movies? Criminals, gangsters, killers, murderers, people who are sexually depraved, people who are greedy and hateful, people who commit acts that are criminal. And we celebrate that in our movies and books. So we have to look at this. These forms of art have a profound influence on the construction of our own temple. When we are observing art, when we're taking in these elements into our psyche, these are the materials with which we work. We ingest them. We digest them. They become a part of us. So when we take in these kinds of influences, what will be the result? Can you build a beautiful temple out of rubbish? Can you build a beautiful soul from trash? We need to transform these elements to bring the purity out and utilize it. We can see this especially in the relations between a man and a woman. It's there between a man and a woman that the power of creation is most profound. Physically obvious that that form of creation can create a physical body. That a man and a woman have that singular power to create a new life. But it's also between a man and a woman that the soul is created. This is the only way. But that man and woman create according to the nature of their consciousness, create according to the nature of their mind. So what will be the result of the creation that they elaborate if in their mind they perpetuate vice? If they allow fear to dominate their mind, or if they allow lust, or if they allow greed. What will be the result of that creation? In these times, what we see is that instead of celebrating the ideals of virtue, the ideals of the consciousness, 
men are celebrated as beasts. In our culture and in our world traditions now, our movies, television, books, our cultural values celebrate man as an animal, as lustful, as violent. And we like it. We celebrate that, that a man should be a beast, should revel in filth, should be covered with dirt, with greed, should be lustful, should be violent, should be cunning, greedy. The ideal of a man in these times is that he should be a money-making machine who will step over anyone These are very low ideals. The ideal of a woman in these times is equally bad. In these times, we don't celebrate the natural beauty of a woman or the qualities of virtue in a woman. In these times, we want women to dress and adorn themselves and paint themselves like prostitutes. Our culture celebrates the idea of a woman being a whore, having no prudence, no chastity. We celebrate the idea of a woman being very foul. And this is very sad. We see nowadays that even young girls dress like prostitutes, having lost even their childhood because of the influence of this very low ideal of a woman. What we see then in our contemporary ideas of a man and woman is that our cultural values are very low. They are the celebration of lust, of greed, of pride. A man wants a woman who will satisfy his lust, And a woman wants a man who will satisfy her fear and her envy. And this is sad. The result is marriages and homes that are true hells, that are full of suffering. Because lust is never satisfied. Fear is never satisfied. Envy is never satisfied. As soon as that spouse fails to satisfy the lust of their partner, that partner will leave and find someone else. As soon as that partner is no longer satisfied with their fear and envy and greed for money, they'll leave and find someone who will satisfy their fear and greed and envy. This is because real love is no longer cultivated and appreciated. Children are inheriting all of these unfortunate influences. Our children now are becoming more and more rebellious, more and more lazy, more and more spoiled, and more and more degenerated. If you've stepped into a school in recent times, you'll see how different it is from when you were a child and how shocking it is. What is expressed now in our culture is no longer the love of beauty, an aesthetic of grace and harmony, an aesthetic of of the cultivation of high ideals. Instead, in our art and architecture and crafts and storytelling, we celebrate greed. We want things cheaper and faster. And that's all. So our art in these times is all about making money, about celebrating our anger, about celebrating our fear. In fact, now... Most people don't cultivate an art. In ancient times, everyone cultivated the arts. Everyone played music, practiced painting or calligraphy, masonry, gardening. Nowadays, if you can't make money doing it, people don't do it. They'll only do it if you can make money. And this is sad, because this has an impact on the development of the consciousness. Truthfully, all of the great initiates have cultivated the fine arts. And Samael Enviore stated this in Astachristic Magic. 
The fine arts are intimately related to the cultivation of beauty, our own human soul. And that's why Gnosis is always emphasizing that we need to live artfully, to live creatively from moment to moment. And this cannot be acquired by imitation. We cannot really learn about Gnosis or become the temple that we should become if we are imitating others. Each of us has our own unique consciousness, our own unique being, who has its own unique gifts, qualities, and powers. That is what we need to embody. Imitation does not lead to that. So when we are seeking to realize the art of Gnosis, it is an art of the individual human soul. But it's based on principles. It's not something you can make up. Remember the four pillars. That art is an expression of the religion, the philosophy, and the science. That's all the wisdom. Art is just the method to do it. Beethoven, for example was a great master who demonstrated his mastery of the principles of art. He mastered all of the scientific principles of music. And he expressed that through his art. He did not abandon the principles, the science, the philosophy, the religion. He mastered them. And in that way, very artfully expressed his own inner being. And there's only one Beethoven. There's only one Richard Wagner. There's only one Buddha. There's only one Dalai Lama. There's only one Guru Rinpoche. And each of these beings mastered the science, the philosophy, and the religion and expressed them through their own unique art. And every one of us is the same. Every one of us is an artist. A creator. And we create from moment to moment by our words, by our thoughts, by our feelings, by our actions. If we learn to be aware of those three traitors in ourselves, the demon of the mind, which is always reasoning and justifying itself, the demon of desire, which is always seeking sensations and satisfaction, the demon of evil will, which is always seeking to fulfill its pride, if we can learn about them in ourselves and learn to listen to the voice of our own inner guru, we can become the artist that we should be, our own unique individual art. In this way, we can understand why all the great writers, all the great painters, all the great musicians studied and mastered the principles of their craft and then became the great artists that they were. Nowadays, we think you should just be able to flip a switch and be a master. Not like that. It takes study. It takes practice. It takes a lot of effort. Mastery comes little by little, according to our works. Mastery in anything. And I would challenge you to approach any of these great masters and ask them if they feel satisfied with their own level of development. And I'm sure you'll find that all of them say no. That they all are aspiring to an even higher ideal. And we should do the same. We should, in fact, learn that life is our canvas. Our life is where we create our art. The media that we use is our energy. If you want to be an artist, if you want to learn how to draw, you need first the surface to draw upon, and that is our paper, our canvas. Then you need a media, some kind of medium that can render the image, and that is our energy. That would be the lead of the pencil or the pigment of a paint. But that medium has to be directed. It has to be guided. It has to be put into place. And we do that with our willpower, and that's the tool, the brush, the pen, the pencil, the instrument. 
And that way you can see that from moment to moment, each of us is creating a piece of art. And that art is us. That art is our soul. And that way we can study and learn that our life reflects our level of being. The nature of our life is the result of our actions. And it reveals our consciousness. If we want a better life, if we want to have a life that's more beautiful, we have to cultivate that beauty, to develop that beauty, to strengthen it. And that beauty is our human soul, Tiferet. That beauty is strengthened when we extract the fire from the sexual waters and bring it up the spine to saturate our psychophysiology and to give us the inspiration, the great light. Unfortunately, in these times, we see that people are depleted. They don't have the energy to create. They don't have the energy to live life well. This is because everyone is wasting their energy from moment to moment through all the three brains. We waste our energy in our mind by obsessively thinking. We waste our energy through our heart by obsessively bouncing between one emotion to the next, by being identified with all of our emotions. We waste our energy through our physical body, through overactivity, through overexertion, or through extreme laziness. And we waste it most especially through sex. Humanity has failed to realize that the key of all powers, the key of all development, the birthplace of the Buddha is in the waters of sexuality. So humanity wastes that energy, expels it, indulges in the orgasm, in sexual pleasure. And when that indulging persists, that energy is being wasted, consumed by the ego repeatedly over and over. The result is that that energy is being depleted out of the body, out of the heart, out of the mind, out of the soul. What is the case now? We age fast. We need Viagra. We need energy drinks. We need caffeine. We need stimulants. People take drugs. They take alcohol. They take whatever they can to try to build and recover the energy that they themselves are wasting. The result is the pineal gland becomes atrophied, becomes destroyed. The endocrine system becomes destroyed. The sexual organs become destroyed. They become weak. They lack power. They lack force. So men lose their virility. Women lose their sexual drive. They lose their mental capacities. They lose their emotional sensitivities. They lose physical energy. They decline they age, they become sick, and they die. This is how the three traitors rule in our three brains. By pulling energy and feeding themselves. The answer is for us to begin to develop this temple for ourselves to save our energy, to learn about the three traitors in ourselves, to observe the mind, to watch ourselves from moment to moment, to be on guard, and moment to moment activate our consciousness, activate this capacity of the human soul. This is where the consciousness comes from. This is where the beauty arises. It's from the consciousness itself. When our consciousness starts to awaken, we start to perceive life in a new way. To see ourselves as we truly are. To see life as it truly is. Little by little, this becomes our great art. The art of the consciousness. To awaken. To become a real human being an embodiment of all the divine principles. Charity, 
love, compassion, tolerance, endeavor, diligence, happiness for others, temperance, fortitude. All of those beautiful qualities of the soul, the beauty of Tifereth. And these are the great beauties that adorn the Temple of Solomon. When you study in the Bible, the temple is described as being made of cedar and pine, but covered with solid gold and all manner of gems and jewels. The gold is the gold of the alchemist, who has taken the lead, the base metals, the filthy metals, and purified them and extracted the most beautiful and pure element, which is the gold itself. And that alchemist, that initiate, has also extracted from their own earth all the jewels, the gems of the consciousness, the jewels of love, compassion and patience, tolerance, diligence. And those are the jewels and gems that adorn the temple and make it beautiful, make it a house of God. Profound reflection upon this story causes us to realize that this temple is our own mind. And if we want Avalokiteshvara, Chinrezi, the Christ, to inhabit the temple of our mind, we have to make it clean. We have to make it pure. How could we invite the Buddha to come and sit in a room filled with filth, with the stench of fear, with the disgusting, vile, rotting matter of pride and lust. But we all have that. Our own temple is defiled. Our own inner temple is impure, is made filthy, by our own hands. So the art of the initiate is to clean the temple, to build it, to perfect it, to make a holy place in ourselves which can perfectly reflect the light of Christ, the light of Chinrezi, the light of Tara, Sarasvati, whatever you want to call that source of virtue. We begin this process now. This doesn't start next week when you decide you're going to take a painting class or join a choir. These are good things to do. But the cultivation of art is how you artfully utilize your will. That is the art of Gnosis. To utilize your willpower for the purposes of beauty. Not for money, not for fame, not because somebody told you, not because all your friends do it, or your family, or your religion, but because you know it's right. And you can only know that by awakening your consciousness, by awakening your human soul and coming to know your own inner spirit to receive those commands directly. This is symbolized when Moses approaches the mount and sees the burning bush and humbles himself and receives the instructions of God. This is symbolized by the Buddha in meditation with his mind perfectly serene within which is reflected all of the contents of the universe. And in that way he can see the truth. In that silence, we construct our temple. And the art of the soul, of the consciousness, can be advanced. Do you have any questions? To learn about art requires that you learn about how to awaken your consciousness. 
when you come to know yourself, then you can start to know what's outside of you. Consciousness and know your mind, then you won't be able to see anything outside. Your consciousness becomes the mirror which reflects the contents of anything else. When we remain asleep, without the consciousness awake, we can't di differentiate easily between good and bad art, between good and bad influences. Things that are very crude or obvious, we can. Right? I mean, it's sort of obvious in some cases. But you cite the example of Paganini. In order for you to have the capacity to fully know the meaning of a given work of art, you have to have an awakened consciousness that can perceive the conscious source of that art. Does that make sense to you? So as an example, Samael Amvior used to visit museums and sacred sites all over and was able, because he had awakened his consciousness, to observe and reflect upon a given sculpture or piece of art and intuitively comprehend its meaning. And that meaning would not be visible to anyone else. But because he had awakened his consciousness and knew himself, he was able to penetrate and see the objective knowledge hidden in that artwork. Sometimes we get a sense of it. We might have a feeling about it. If you look at the Mona Lisa, its meaning is not obvious, but its power is undeniable. If you look at the statues of the Greeks or the great temples of the Egyptians or the Aztec, you see the same. The power of these creations is undeniable, but the meaning eludes us. So we have to awaken consciousness. Right. That's a good point. The point, the point is made that it's from the heart that art emerges. And that heart is the method through which, the mirror through which we can perceive beauty. Of course, the heart is where we find Tifret on the Tree of Life. Tifret sits on the heart. More questions? So in general, in synthesis, it's a very powerful and useful tool for us to use in our own development to cultivate the fine arts, to take up an instrument or a pen or a brush, to write, to paint, to do our gardening, to use our creative expression, but to do it because we love doing it not because we want to show it to someone, to compete with someone, to impress someone, or to get rich. Or cooking is another example. So I encourage you to cultivate the fine arts in yourself. But if you feel those influences of competition, of money, of fear, then keep your art to yourself. Keep your art in silence until the time comes when those influences are not burdening you any longer. All the great masters of art in our history simultaneously developed the physical skills of their art. Richard Wagner studied art, studied music, studied symphonic construction, studied how the instruments work, studied how the human voice works, studied composition, theory, all of the aspects of music that are important in that tradition. At the same time, he cultivated the practice of meditation. He cultivated the art of transmutation. And when the time came when his mind was prepared and sufficiently developed to reflect the light of his innermost, he was able to do it because he had the physical skills to do it. So we can proceed likewise. Where we feel a calling, an impulse, an interest, just because we love it 
just because we care for it. And whatever field of life, be it business or painting or music, cultivate those skills, develop those skills. Any skill can be compatible with the development of your soul. But develop them simultaneously. And in that way, you can have that harmony, which is necessary for the complete construction of your own temple. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.